uh, in their elections because of uh, partisan gerrymandering, mm -hmm. which is, uh, is a huge problem uh, in the state of Ohio. We're one of the worst states uh, to our system of drawing lines and, and how uh, partisan it is and how unaccountable that makes us uh, to, to you, the people. Uh, so I have uh, been a constant uh, kind of watchdog on uh, just the basic uh, fundamental right to vote. Uh, we've seen uh, dozens of bills be introduced to make it harder to vote in the state of Ohio, uh, whether it be uh, trying to cut down the early voting uh, days and times, uh, there are laws that are now on the books that uh, make counting votes harder. So you may think uh, that you have your right to vote, but what we're seeing is tens of thousands of ballots are thrown out uh, in every election, often without people knowing uh, that their vote wasn't counted. And that problem, unfortunately, has gotten worse since I got into office because of some bills uh, that have been passed. Those are always a little harder to get people's attention on because How do they, justify uh, they usually say, you know, this last General Assembly, we had a couple of those bills passed and they had no proponents, no supporters. Uh, it was just a very partisan effort uh, to make voting harder. And when the districts are like this, they don't really have to justify it. And often, uh, their supporters are pretty far to the right and support uh, these measures that make it harder for people to vote. We just had the Ohio Christian Alliance uh, do a lobby day last week in support of a photo ID bill. Uh, I'm not sure what's Christian about making it harder to vote, <laughs> but... Uh, an example of the county, a bill that, that makes it harder to count how they can throw out. So we had two bills pass um, in 20, uh, I think in 2013 or 2014, that legislative, the last General Assembly, uh, and one bill uh, made it harder to count uh, absentee ballots. And what it did is required more information to be included on the absentee ballot envelope that you put your ballot in when you mail it back. Uh, and if you forget something or make a simple error. A, lot, a, a common error people make is when they write their birth date down, they write the current year rather than their, the year of their birth. Um, obviously, people weren't, aren't newborns um, casting their votes. It's, it's something that we know is a simple error that people make. Uh, but that's an example of a way that your vote could be thrown out if you make a simple error like that. It, you used to just be required to have, I think, your name, your signature, and your date of birth uh, on the absentee ballot envelopes, which already trips people up um, with the exact problem I just mentioned. Now you're required to put your, your full address uh, on the envelope, uh, and you can't make any mistakes, leave your zip code off, or transpose a number in your zip code. They also are requiring that a voter put their ward in precinct on their absentee ballot envelope. I don't know my ward or precinct, for example, uh, but we're seeing that boards of elections have not printed the envelopes that way. So I'm glad that they, uh, it's pretty clear in the law, but they have chosen not to follow that. But they are following, I think, some of the, the more basic uh, provisions in that law. We saw the rate of ballots thrown out between 2012 and 2014, which is one those two laws, there was a, so the same thing was done for provisional ballots, making it harder. You have to fill out more information. You used to just have to have your printed name and your signature uh, on a provisional ballot for it to count. It's kind of silly that you have to have your printed name, I'll say, but now you have to have all that information. You have to have your ID number, your address, your date of birth, your signature, and your printed name uh, done by the voter or that vote isn't counted. So we've seen the rate double in the amount of votes that were thrown out between 2012 before the, that law was enacted and 2014. It, it makes it, you know, the argument that a lot of these older citizens that have difficulty getting to the poll, that they have difficulty standing in line for long times to vote absentee, 
because they don't think their vote's going to get counted. It's a serious problem, and, and we, you know, that's why I'm here to kind of let you know about that. And also, um, it, you know, in some ways, it's like a literacy test. Uh, if you can't read the small print of what's supposed to be in that line or the directions that say you, you need to fill out every portion of this form or your vote won't count, um, you know, in some ways you have to make sure you're able to read all that uh, before you're able to vote. And last I checked, things like poll taxes and literacy tests were clear violations of, of our Constitution. So, so, so maybe there needs to be groups out there uh, helping people with their absentee ballot. So I don't want to get too sidetracked on, on this issue, but it is an important one, and I appreciate your concern about it. And there are, you know, League of Women Voters has a strong presence in the State House. Thankfully so. I'm a member of the League uh, the Kent League of Women Voters. But they do a lot of both advocacy to try their best to prevent measures like this from going into place. Uh, and they also do a lot of voter registration work and poll monitoring and assistance uh, with voters. And it's hard, though, to get to every individual voter, and that's why I'm so concerned about provisions like this. And the reason I even bring up something like this, I know uh, health care is, is what you all are passionate about, but of course, if people can't vote for their, their legislators or their leaders or their issues, you know, it's very hard for us to do the advocacy work that that is so important to us. So keep on guard and, and hold elected officials accountable uh, that vote for all of these voter suppression measures. We have a photo ID bill uh, that's been introduced in the legislature. That will make it very difficult for certain groups of Ohioans to vote, uh, especially uh, minority populations, low-income populations, young, uh, you know, student voters, elderly voters often don't have a, a valid driver's license if they're not uh, driving anymore or if they never drove, which we see is, is the case with some of our elderly population. Again, the average person says, what's the big deal? I have a driver's license, but it is a big deal. There are about, I think, a million Ohioans that mm -hmm could potentially be impacted by a strict uh, photo ID only provision for voting. So something to, I know you're fighting on a lot of issues, but something for us to keep in mind how that could hurt uh, and cut down on our voting public. Um, and then finally I'll say on the redistricting issue, uh, that's one that, you know, Almost everywhere I go, I may not be an expert, like I'm certainly not a healthcare policy expert, but I feel pretty confident any group I go before that's passionate about an issue saying, I, I am an expert on something that's really key to what you are trying to advance, and it is redistricting. You know, right now in Ohio, uh, we, have a, we have a pretty 50-50 <coughs> moderate state when it comes to um, you know, who we support in elections. We had 48% of Ohio uh, elect John Kasich in 2010. We had 51% of Ohio vote to uh, send President Barack Obama back to the White House in 2012. I'm going to just brush over what happened in 2014. Uh, but we generally have a 50-50 state. But unfortunately, when you look at our uh, delegations in Columbus and Congress, it's way out of whack with that 50-50 voting public. We have a 70-30 split in the Ohio legislature towards the Republican Party because they were the ones that drew the lines. And with our congressional delegation, it's even worse. It's 75-25. Uh, that's just way out of whack uh, with, with what uh, what is representative democracy, which is what our legislatures are supposed to be. And, uh, you know, it really produces extreme, the, the races for these gerrymandered seats that are, say, 70 or 80 percent uh, one party becomes a primary race, and who can kind of out right wing, in some, in some cases left wing, uh, each other. So when you get to Columbus, you have just the polar opposite 
uh, of, of political leaders and then try to get them to come together on an issue, number one, that's very difficult, and number two, most of your legislators are way to one side, and that's what we really are seeing uh, in both Congress and Columbus. And I'll tell you that, when I'm in Portage County, I'm in a fairly moderate district, it leans about 54% to the Democrats, so that actually isn't usually considered a competitive seat. Usually it's between uh, 48 and 52 is considered to be competitive. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a little bit of a bellwether type of district. And, you know, Republicans and Democrats often work together uh, in, our community, in our local communities. They support school levies. Uh, they care about, you know, local communities having police and fire protection and, and basic services. And they care about those among us who uh, are kind of in the shadows and need a little uh, extra help. But you do not see that at all when you're in Columbus. You really see the kind of caricature of the extreme, kind of the Glenn Beck, Fox News type of politician that, you know, I just didn't, didn't I don't encounter that every day except when I'm, when I'm in the State House. Can you talk a, in two or three sentences about the bill <clears throat> that will be on the ballot? Or the yeah, I'm just going to get to that. Thank so you. in November, <laughs> you all will have an opportunity to really you know, play a role in changing uh, this redistricting problem. And I really think that will help in your advocacy efforts down the road when you have you know, fairer representatives to turn to for the issues you care about. So state issue one will be on the November uh, 2015 ballot. And I encourage you all to vote yes on that issue. Uh, what that will do is will require, instead of right now, you, the Republicans basically just draw the lines for both uh, Congress and the State House. This only deals with State House, so we still have a broken system for Congress. But what it will do is require minority votes to pass a map, to pass a plan for how the districts will be represented uh, for the next 10 years. And in addition to that, uh, there will be criteria set in the law that makes the partisan gerrymandering very difficult and limits the ability uh, for either side to do gerrymandering. It's kind of basic fairness criteria it says something like uh, no district can be drawn uh, with you know, partisan interest as the main uh, factor for that district. And it also limits the amount of times that you can split counties and municipalities and townships. And that there is the, is the thing that will really limit uh, the ability to, to partisan gerrymander. So the two things in that bill are minority uh, input in passing a plan and fairness criteria for the plan that's crafted. It's, it's simple um, and I, I really strongly encourage you uh, to support it in November. It had bipartisan support out of the legislature uh, and I have introduced, just so you all know, I think Congress is equally as important. I've introduced a plan that would do the same thing but for Congress and I'm working with a Columbus area legislator, Mike Curtin, uh, to try to get attention to that issue and, and get that plan passed as well. And that takes effect in after the 2020 census? Yeah. Until the 2020 census. And that is part of the compromise that got the bipartisan support was the Republicans wanted us all to suffer under this current map <laughs> <laughs> until it's the, the full Sorry. life of the map, which is, is 2022. Right. And the last redistricting proposal we had on the ballot, which you may remember, it, had, it got killed, but part of it, the reason it got killed is because the Republicans spent a lot of money and energy defeating it because it had a provision in it that said, we'll redraw the lines if, as soon as this passes. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter what it said, they were going to be against that and put the power of all their corporate money uh, against that, and they did, and it lost big. Yeah. Are there any other cleverer ways they use than just party identification to justify the redistricting, or is it just so obvious we know what's going on? They generally uh, 
are uncomfortable and they have to defend what they've done and they just try uh, not to you know not to be put in that position and they just say this is the system we have you mm -hmm. know we Democrats could have won these yeah. elections. Yeah. We happen yeah. to win these elections, yeah. and you know, to the to the victors go the spoils. Yeah. And that's generally, uh, if you can get them on record defending it, that's generally what they say. Hey, we didn't invent this system. We're just operating in yeah. it, and you guys can continue to suffer. What? I know this doesn't have the future, but what what really prevented the change the previous ten years from the Democrats? were in control? Um, the Republicans in the Senate wouldn't support uh, the proposal that was put forward uh, by the Democrats, even though I think the Democrats had the most to lose from redistricting reform, because at that time we held those offices, and it had been a long 30 years of Republicans holding them. So there, were, there was a lot of angst in the Democratic Party saying, you know, we, we really want to stick it to these guys and draw the maps to benefit us. But we came forward with a proposal, and John Husted was who we were dealing with, and the, he was in the Senate at the time, and he couldn't get his Republican senators uh, to go along with the plan that passed the House, even though he gets all kinds of credit uh, for being the person for redistricting reform, he couldn't get it done. And that's really what ended up happening. All right, I'll take one more and then we'll move on. But I'm happy, if there's time, I'm happy to come back I, I, to this. I guess I'm asking you to move on because I'd like some takeaway tips on building relationships. Well, perfect, here we go. <laughs> um, good, so, so those are the issues, the voting issues I've been working on. Another issue I'll just say is on, on a healthcare front, on all these attacks that have occurred on, on women's reproductive health care have been things that I've been very outspoken against. The defunding of Planned Parenthood, uh, and uh, you know additional restrictions on um, women's health. And I'll move on now. I, I hear you over there. Um, so tips for you in, in talking to your uh, legislators. Um, first of all, you should make sure you know who your legislators are. Um, there's a lot of changes uh, with term limits. So um, term limits and you know the effect that it has on uh, people will leave even sooner than their terms because they're trying to figure out what their next move is. So knowing who both your representative and your senator is, and with district changing, is often hard. I often have people who think I'm their representative and I'm not. Although I'm always happy to talk with people about state issues, whether or not I'm there, um, you know, within their district line. I think that um, contacting your legislator uh, and trying to get a meeting with them and talk about your issue is a strong way uh, to, uh, to have your voice be heard. Um, that's probably the strongest. Uh, and using a uh, personal experience that you have if you're in the healthcare field, uh, that's something that's very helpful to us. Uh, we're not in the healthcare field except for maybe one or two legislators. Uh, so it's very helpful for us to hear from people that are seeing patients and dealing with these issues uh, every day. That's much more authoritative uh, than we are. And it's a little bit more authoritative than um, you know, having talking points and, and knowing about the issues. Uh, second, I would say if you've had you know, your experience with the healthcare system and how it's impacted you or your family member, in a negative way. Telling those personal stories uh, is, is, again, more, I think, impactful uh, than um, sometimes when you do advocacy, you're going through a group and you have talking points. Uh, those are helpful for us, but it's much more persuasive to me when it's a personal story uh, about an experience that you've had. Um, and kind of going into some detail with that, and maybe even putting some stuff in writing for us to, you know, often when we have a meeting, we have six meetings in a row, and, you know, we have that meeting, it makes an impact, but by the sixth meeting, you know, the second meeting might be a little blurry <coughs> to you, so, you know, trying to, to have something for us in writing to take away is always helpful. 
Uh, another way you can be impactful, and I'm kind of going in order, I would say, of most impact to least impact. So the next uh, way that you can be impactful is to uh, attend an event of a legislator that's in your district, say a town hall meeting uh, or office hours, uh, if that legislator has them. A lot of legislators don't have these for the, this very reason that they may not want to hear from uh, their constituents <laughs> in public where there might be a reporter in the room, but that's a really great opportunity for you, especially if there's a reporter there. Because usually at a town hall meeting, there's opportunity. I know at mine, I have uh, Q and A, um, and there's an opportunity for you to say an issue that's important to you and get their response on the record. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, find out about these meetings? Um, you, I know for me, uh, and I know this is the case for the other legislators I know that have town hall meetings. I do an email to my email list. So I would request to be added to your legislator's email list. Uh, I also do a press release uh, to my local, I have a local daily newspaper in Kent. Uh, so it's read, not read widely beyond my community, but it's closely followed by a lot of people in my community. It doesn't always get picked up, but usually they'll put it in. Uh, and I, I do a monthly newsletter and usually put my dates in there as well. Uh, so it's like two emails that go out, uh, and that's, that's about it. Sometimes, and this is a rare, I do a, a phone call, it's like a robo-dial, which I know everyone loves those, uh, but it, just to remind people, hey, I'm going to be in your area next Tuesday, would love to have you come out to my town hall meeting. If you can't make it to my town hall meeting, here's my number if you have any issues, you know, in the future. I pay to do that, so... Um, you know, you don't see that too frequently, but that's a good way, I think, to, to make an impact and also kind of to get to know your legislator because if they've seen your face multiple times, it just, it, it, you know, it starts to make an impact and they, they want to hear from you and they're more likely, I think, to listen. Yeah. What about these calls you get from your um, congressman where they want you to be on a telephone town hall? Or is that a way to screen out questions they don't want to deal with? No, I, I, I've never been on one of those. That's, those are expensive and mm -hmm. typically done. I think it's more than the congressional. Right? Yeah, and I know Sherrod Brown does them, and like, a, you know, hundreds of people join those. So I don't know if you're really able to get a question through. It's hard. I've sat on them waiting. Have you? I just always, wondered if they were screening you out. They've always felt like political yeah. advertisement yeah. to me. Yeah. And because that's what town hall like meetings kind of are, uh, to be honest. But but if you leave, well, I would assume most people do leave time for Q&A. So then, you know, you can't script that. I think sometimes they do try to script town halls, like they may have Hey, if you have a question, submit it on a note card. That's always like a sign. Hey, I'm probably not going to ask your tough question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I don't do that. And I've had some tough situations. I mean, I have a pretty strong tea party in my, my district. And, you know, they try to put me on the spot. And that's fine. I'm an elected leader. I represent them as well. And I'm happy to tell them I disagree with them on whatever, you know, usually whatever the issue is. Um, let me say a couple more things, make sure I get through my list, and then let's open it up for questions. So I would also say um, next after, you know, meeting them in the district, putting them on the spot, always a good <coughs> idea, and as nice a way as you can. Um, I think that letters and emails to legislators' offices do make a difference. Um, it's, it's, again, it's a lower impact. Uh, and if it's an individual email, it makes a little bit more of a difference than a, you know, something you've got from your state association. Um, although I do read those too. Usually I just read one, respond to it, and then we respond. I know, I get a, I'll just tell you how it works. I have a folder that I get each week from my, I only have one staff person but from my aide with probably 30 to 60 emails in it, and they're grouped by subject, and we, she drafts a response for me, and I usually hand edit it pretty carefully. We, our response is usually pretty short. Hey, thanks for your email. 
Um, I have one for if I agree, and I have one for if I disagree, a standard response. The disagree response is, uh, thanks for writing in. Um, glad to hear you advocating for an issue. If I can help in the future, let me know. Goodbye. <laughs> um, if I agree, uh, you, it's not much longer just because of how many emails come through. But I do think it's important to respond. I just say, hey, thanks for writing in. Um, you know, I agree that healthcare is a critical issue, and we, you know, we don't have enough access. And here's a bill I am working on, or here's something that I just voted on recently that I think moves the ball forward. Um, keep up, you know, keep up the important work you're doing, and keep in touch uh, is what I usually do. It depends. Sometimes it's a general email. Hey, will you support this issue? Sometimes it's a specific. Hey, support this bill, um, and I try to answer whatever the ask is. But making your ask really clear is important. I get a lot of emails that are just like, "Hey, I care about healthcare. Um, you need to be, you know, you need to do more. You know, sign constituent." And it's like, "Whoa, you know, that's like a huge issue." And usually, uh, if it's something more like, "Hey," Uh, I read about uh, House Bill 13 in the newspaper recently. Uh, this is this would be really important to my family that suffers from you know this illness. If it's you know something particular to that, um, I really it's important to me that you sign on as a co-sponsor or that you uh, vote for this bill should it come to the floor. You know that's a, that's you know yeah, I'm on the spot there. You know there's no wiggle room. Oh yeah, I support you too. Like you you've asked a very specific question, and you, you know you sh you deserve a specific answer. So I I want you to know that emails and letters to the office are not ignored um, by most. Some maybe do, mm -hmm. but most of us respond. Um, and, and 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 it also is helpful to if I see one email on an issue or if I see 25 emails on an issue, you know I, I note that okay this is this is becoming something real serious in my district that you know isn't just kind of an outlier uh, thing. The other thing too is I often sort out uh, emails that are not from the district, uh, and if they're a form email. I, I probably won't even respond if they're from outside of my district. If they're an individualized email, I will think about it. Um, I may forward it on to the correct representative and say, hey, uh, you know, this constituent is concerned about this issue. Um, I hope you will respond. Uh, or I'll respond. It kind of just depends. And I think those are those are the different ways that, that you can uh, work with your legislators. And, and I would just say, too, um, there's a lot of local advocacy work that I am sure you all engage in that, in some ways, I think right now is more important than trying to engage uh, to you know, spend too much time and energy at the state level, just because it's so broken uh, and so unaccountable to you, and if say you get a Democrat to do a bill for you, for example, which I, I think you, that you are working on now, that bill probably won't even get a hearing. Or if it does get a hearing, uh, one thing that they've done in the past, uh, they did last General Assembly. So every two years, the General Assembly resets, as you guys probably know. So we just started over in January. So every bill has to be reintroduced. And there's a rule that you have to get one hearing on your bill at least. So what they'll do is they'll put a hundred hearings on the calendar for the last week of the General Assembly when there's probably not even a session scheduled anymore and we'll have like a five-hour hearing uh, with uh, you know 25 bills getting their hearing. And I often don't even, I just pull my bill down and I don't need to go through the insult of, of that process. Both well, the parties uh, do that equally? No, I mean the Republican the Republican bills get lots of hearings and get to go to the floor and get voted on, but most of our bills never they get their hearing. But it's again like the last week of lame duck when there's no possibility that it could po you know possibly get to the floor and then get to the Senate and you know be voted on. So 
just something to keep in mind, you know, when you're kind of hounding your Democrat legislators, like we are in a very tough position with getting anything done. And that's why we need your help on, on the redistricting issue. I think that's all I'll say in my prepared remarks. Um, and I appreciate the dialogue uh, that we've already had. And I'm happy to, to talk through any, anything a little bit uh, more. Let me start back there, and then we'll, yeah. OK. Um, <clears throat> my uh, unions uh, <clears throat> have a rapid response committee. We mostly work federal, but we do some state stuff. And um, one Which of the things that they that? I'm sorry? Which union? Steel work. Nice. Okay. One of the things they say is it's better to <clears throat> to um, get like a phone call or a handwritten letter has more impact than sending an email or signing a petition. Um, and I'm just wondering, does that really make a difference? And then the second thing is, when we do get people to make phone calls, usually we say, you know, the, all they do is take a check, you know, whether, so it really doesn't matter what you say on the issue, just so we make it clear what you want, because they just check, you know, yes or no. And would you say, and do you keep a count of how many you get on each side, and does, does that make a difference to you on, on what you do? So of, of all the things you mentioned, I would say um, for my office, and I think this is a little different rep to rep, but for my office, an individualized email is probably the best. Uh, second best is probably a note, a handwritten note or a letter. It doesn't have to be handwritten, but coming through the mail. And that is a, maybe a generational thing. Um, and it's also a little bit of mail, uh, it can be slow. Uh, and sometimes there's delivery issues within the office. Um, third, I would say a form email. Uh, and then fourth, signing. I, signing petition, that often doesn't do anything. I don't even find out about those. Um, unless it's a petition and then an email gets sent to a legislative office. But if you do something on like change.org or I mean, I see a lot of that stuff just like through my own Facebook friends, uh, but we never get anything about that, uh, just so you know. On the phone call, I would put that above, um, I put that equal to a form email. Um, unless it is a uh, specific, if it's something you're doing, sometimes an issue will come up, like recently, um, trying to think of a recent phone issue. Library funding is always one where we get a lot of phone calls. And I think that is because librarian, librarians are very um, knowledgeable about how to, you know, about government and how to impact their government. And they also have access to a lot of networks and they encourage people who use the library or that they know to do what they've just done. So I probably got 25 calls. And I, I do, I get a report at the end of the day uh, letting me know that we got, you know, 25 calls um, on this issue, and what she's, you know, she'll check in with me. She doesn't know it. She knows I support libraries, so she just tells them that. Uh, but you know, she'll ask me before she responds uh, if she doesn't know how I, how I feel about that. And it does matter if I'm reading through. I get a daily email from my office, just kind of here's the calls that came in, um, here's things you need to know about, here's questions I have, and. That could be where an individual question, an individualized letter comes in, and she doesn't know how to respond. That's where I would read about it. And I would see it eventually, but I only look at that stuff once a week. Um, so I don't know where, why I got off on that, but um, that's kind of how it works as far as me finding out about it. And it matters. If I see 25 people call, I, that's a little, ching, you know, OK, that's, that's an issue. And when a union member calls me, that's always very important to me in my office. And I am a strong supporter of organized labor and always appreciate um, hearing from them. Let me go in the back. I, I, you, you haven't asked a question yet, so I'll come back to you. 
Progress Ohio has a uh, meeting each year in the spring uh, called the Grassroots Camp. And I've given seminars there from several years. I gave it last Saturday. And one of the titles that I talk on is Contacting Lawmakers in Washington and Columbus. And I'm a great advocate in communicating with people in Washington by fax. And I have a little booklet uh, that has all the fax numbers in because they get it immediately, they have a piece of paper, they can either read it, throw it away, put it in the file. Unfortunately, when you call people, in, in, at least in Washington, they get so many calls, the, the least, the person with the least ability answers the phone, and he makes the tick you're for or against the issue. And the mail may get screened out in the anthrax <laughs> until after the issue is over. Uh, as far as in Ohio is concerned, there's a valuable publication you can get by writing to the Ohio Council of Churches. Uh, the address that you can get on the telephone book or go on email and get it or I'll give it to you. I have it. I don't have it with me. And they have the legislator's home address mm -hmm. and telephone number. I don't like that option. Well, that, well, <laughs> but the thing of it is, from the point of view of the activists like me, it's valuable because you can send something to your legislator and they'll surely get it. Let me, some response. Number one, and I'm sure you know this, but for the room, big difference between Washington and Columbus. You know, members of Congress have 20 or so staff members, senators, you know, a lot more than that, rightfully so, and their districts are bigger. Uh, members of the Ohio House have one staffer. They're paid very little, so there's high turnover, and it's usually at an entry level. Uh, my my uh, person just graduated from college last year. It's her first job which I think is great in a lot of ways. And this is an opportunity for me to train her and get her out there doing, you know, lefty, progressive <laughs> work. Um, she's a woman. I kind of have a little preference to, to give women a job in politics and government and get them out there. Maybe she um, in the future. Yes, exactly. And she's interested in that. Uh, but, you know, there's lots of mistakes here and there, and so it's her first time dealing with almost every issue that comes up. So, patience, like for today, I actually had me going to the Ramada, um, you know, and luckily I had built in extra time, and I think this was originally scheduled at the Ramada, so it's perfectly, un but you know, there's little things that occur like that when you write in, for example. So, um, a big difference in staffing. Um, on the faxes, our faxes on in the state house come in via email. So if you fax something to me, I receive. I don't receive a paper copy. Uh, well, I do because my aide prints out our emails. But I receive an email saying you got a fax, and then it has the contents of it. And I don't know if Congress has, I bet you that is the same in Congress, but I'm not sure. Uh, and that's a pretty recent uh, technological, te technological advance that we've had in probably the last <coughs> four or five years that we don't have fax machines anymore. We have the, we have outgoing fax. No, we don't. It's all done by, by computer. Um, I think the phone calls serve a purpose when I, I, I actually, I think the phone calls are helpful um, because they get, basically they get written down and told to me. So it's like an email. Um, the only issue is it's maybe a little harder to get through um, and you may end up leaving a voicemail, which is, could be frustrating. So that, that's my feedback on that. But I do think that it is, it is different when you're dealing with the federal level. And I know sometimes members of Congress have interns answering their phone, which is not even full-time, you know, entry-level staff. It's like, it's like not even there yet. 
So, and, and I understand that they're getting a lot of calls and that's good for that young person to learn, but it, it can be a little frustrating when you have, you know, something that's urgent and important uh, to deal with. Are you, I was said I'd come to you. I answered my question. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, well, um, I've been to Columbus numerous times. Fan has a lobby day in, in April, general, generally. And usually we talk to the legislative assistant. We seldom, occasionally we get. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel for you on this. When you do that, you say jackpot. Yeah, <laughs> good. But the but the other thing that I I've done is take them to lunch when they're home in the district. I presume that's better if you can pull that off. I've even taken Lewis Blessing who's uh, could very conservative Junior? on the other the side. The young one or the older one? Good, <laughs> good. He needs that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, you see, our bill, we tried to get it on the, for five years, collect signatures to get it on, at, on the ballot as, through the initiative process. And the bill had a legal summary page and a half, uh, uh, each sentence was a very discreet feature of the bill, so I converted that to questions, and then we went through the whole thing, and now he was against everything. Really? <laughs> except that And he we, told you that. Well, except that when we left, when we parted, he stunned me, because he said, I'm mindful of how negative I was about this, but I do want you to know that you raised some issues that I hadn't thought about. And I said, bullseye. Yeah, that's good, and that's progress. So, uh, so, so you're, you're saying if you can get to the legislator, that's better because that legislative assistant is uh, pretty low on the totem pole and it's not a high fidelity system. That, I think on legislative lobby days, um, and I'll just tell you what I do in my office, I try uh, to, to stop in at least if I can't, you know, be at the entire meeting. Uh, I also look, if it's people I already know, sometimes I'll say, okay, like if it's Deb, I just, you know, I got to see Deb a, a couple weeks ago, she'll understand um, if I'm not there personally, if I have a conflict. If I don't have a conflict, I'll be there. Uh, often. The problem is, is we're in committees, and it's t it's a it's a tough. T I'll walk out of committee sometimes when it's a constituent meeting, but if I have a vote, I have to be you know I don't want it to be recorded that I missed missed a vote. That could that could be a political issue for me in the future. Um, but those meetings, uh, I try to I try to be there. It is. Um, The other thing I look for is if it's actually a constituent, because a lot of times I'll have groups say they want to schedule a visit with me, and then it'll be people from um, Cleveland, you know, and I'm kind of like, hey, I like Cleveland, but you know, I got to be in committee, and my aide will take that meeting, and I don't hold that against the organization. You're trying to schedule all these meetings; it's really hard. But for me, if someone is from, came from my district, like I give extra effort to try to do it. So just so you guys know, and then I would say. It's not bad if it's the aid. Some aides are also have been with their member for years. There is a little variance between aides, and some aides are passionate about specific areas too. So they'll, you know, they'll go to bat for you a little bit more with their uh, member um, than you know if it's something they're not at all familiar with. Um, and my aide does a little write up for me about each meeting. So again, in that report I get at the end of the day, she's like, hey, I'm at the libraries today. They um, really want the language they got in the budget to stay there. She keeps it pretty short, but usually, you know, you, you want it when you have those visits, you want to have kind of a specific one, two, three uh, that you're trying to accomplish. And I would encourage you to have that with any contact you have with the legislator. One to three specific action steps, and maybe one to two is, is really the best. Yes. Just a couple quick things. I know this is going to be difficult for you to give me an answer and speak on behalf of other legislators in different districts, but oftentimes, you, your comment earlier was that 
um, that you don't often take, um, you know, pay attention to those outside your district so much. I mean, those are kind of lower on the totem pole. And I'm just wondering, because some, oftentimes we're encouraged to contact those who have initiated legislation, who may be from the other party, who may be from another part of the state, you know, can you generally speak to that, number one, in just, I mean, maybe you can't, but you know, how receptive do you think they may be or not? Are they gonna know that I'm a registered Democrat? Is that even, you know, and then they're just not gonna pay any attention to me at all, uh, or am I wasting my time? And also the question that you, the issue that you brought up about the acceptance of emails and that form of, of response being a generational thing. You know, there are so many people in the legislature who are who, the legislature who are a decade or two older than you. So there's kind of one. Three. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, um, and that goes for our governor as well. But so, do they respond more to emails as opposed to other things? So it's a two-part question. Sure. If you can respond at all. I would say that for and I that I said that and I didn't follow up with the point that that you're drawing out now. I do think the handwritten. Uh, letters, maybe more to the older okay. uh, legislators. Um, I'm not sure though, because I, I bet you they have a system similar to mine where they print out emails. Because mm -hmm. especially, I do notice older, uh, like my dad, he always wants to print everything, you know. And so, I, you know, if, if you have a printed email and a letter, it, it really kind of, there's not much difference at mm -hmm. that point. Um, and I'm like that too, which is why I say that affectionately for my dad and others. Uh, I like, you know, I still read a newspaper every day, or try to, so. Um, but there are some generational, and I feel kind of like, now all of our committee information is on an iPad, we don't have any printouts, and it's like, oh my God, like I'm trying to figure out where an amendment fits into a bill, and it, I can't even, it's so hard to do, so. But that's what I meant about that. And I think it's different when you're approaching a legislator outside of your area as a group, as, an, as a representative of a statewide group um, that you have a relationship with or that you have a, a connection to. That kind of, that rule about not contacting people outside your district kind of goes away when, you, when you're doing it through a group or through a connection that's pre-established. Or, or to a committee. Ye the committee is composed of people from several different districts. So if you want to comment on the Ohio budget, you've got to send it to the House and the Senate Finance Committee. Does that work? I still think it is best to go through your rep to, like, for example, on the budget, every rep has a voice. I, I mean, I'm on the Finance Committee. I'm not the chair or uh, ranking member, but uh, I, you know, other, there's a process in place that every rep has an opportunity to submit amendments and be an advocate on the budget. Um, I know I'm a ranking member of a committee uh, and I get contacted by groups, like I, I'm on the voting, I call it the Voter Suppression Committee, it's really the Government Oversight Committee. Uh, so when groups contact me, like Legal Women Voters or uh, different voting advocacy groups, um, I'm responsive, but when a, you know one individual from Defiance, Ohio, sends me an email, um, I, I generally would send that to the representative for Defiance. Yes. Oh. Um, Next. He mentioned earlier about how he took a uh, representative to lunch. Is that considered like a bribe? <laughs> no, our That's ethics right laws, uh, our ethics laws allow um, us to have up to a seventy-five dollar meal. <laughs> there you go, you have steak and lobster. Um, up to a seventy-five dollar meal without reporting it, uh, and. <laughs> Money. Yeah. But I would say um, some reps 